by the time I finished writing it, I, d- I didn't really, I didn't feel like it was a catchy title. The word trespass, I was kind of forcing in there because it kind of sounded biblical, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, those who trespass against you. And, and, and uh, I really just, I liked the idea of focusing on the fact that the ending, you know, features kind of like a paradox conversation um, more. So I changed the title. Hello, everybody. It's your boy, Neil Starling, and I am back here with another podcast. Today, I have a special guest. He is actually one of my favorite, actually not one of, but my favorite author to the Never Hero series. That is a big deal to me. He has other works in motion, as well as going into works on writing his third book, which I'm really looking forward to. He is also a father. He is stationed in Seattle, I believe. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's subject to change at this point. But um, I have here Todd Ellery Hodges. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, man? Pretty good, man. I'm pretty excited that I got in contact with you and we got an opportunity to do this. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate the uh, chance. Yeah, definitely, man. So, uh, you know, like before we go into any questions uh, regarding your books, I kind of just want to know a little bit about you. So if you want to just like take some time and just give me a little 411 about the type of human being that you are, I'd love to hear it. Oh, you mean like a, you want like a resume or like a, you know, your Batman origin story, you know, (laughs) (laughs) let's see. Uh, I'll be 40 next year. I'm 39. Uh, I live in Seattle. You covered that. Um, I went to the UW. I, uh, I originally came from California and I moved up here when I was 19. Um, I have a, I have a degree in molecular biology, but, uh, I was always, I was always kind of drawn to writing. I just, when I was um, in my twenties, I never really imagined that I'd be able to make a living doing it. And then, um, you know, the whole uh, the whole Kindle revolution um, and the and the indie author scene kind of changed the industry, and that got me interested. And so, about gosh, seven years ago, maybe I am. Um, I started working on the on the first book. I had it in my head for six years before that. I tried to write it three times, but I always kind of got dissuaded. I didn't like how it was coming out on the page, and so I would just go back to my nine to five and say, "Well, you tried." Um, but on the third try, I think I was motivated enough to see it through. Um, yeah, and this is my cat who is interrupting. But, I, know, uh, I love animals. People love cats. You know, on YouTube, there's nothing but cat videos that get millions and millions of views. So uh, it's all good to have a cat on there. I can add that on my tags. <laughs> <laughs> cat interruption. Yeah, this exactly. This is Moxie. Moxie. Okay, right on, right on. Yeah, Hello, Moxie. Like, How are you doing? <laughs> um, let's see. I, uh, I became a father uh, three-ish years ago. Um, I've got a three-year-old and a two-year-old. I was a stepfather before that. Um, so I should, shouldn't have said, yeah. I always make it, I hate it when I make it sound like there's a difference between stepfather and biological because there isn't. Um, but, right. uh, uh, but, uh, ever since that getting writing done has been super challenging. So it's, it's kind of funny. Like, uh, I know how this will sound, how I come off when I say this, but it's, it's funny to say it in a bad way, which is, uh, one of my, uh, one of my in-laws kind of fell on some hard times and then the quarantine happened. And so they ended up coming to live with me and it, and, it's been the most productive month I've had in like two years because of free babysitting being uh, available in the house now. <laughs> so yeah. like, um, cause I, I like to work, get to work really early, like nine 30 in the morning to, to 11 or like my prime hours. And then till three, I'm still pretty good. But after three my brain just kind of, um, rebels, it's like, mm-hmm. go watch a YouTube video or, uh, or just, just stop using me. <laughs> um, and, uh, so like, the, the biggest problem I've had over the last few years is uh, is getting in that window of time where my brain actually wants to be creative and write. Um, 
So that and I've uh, I've decided to change. Sorry, you know what? I'm kind of just talking and going. I did. No, it's okay. It definitely, yeah. it's all right. <laughs> uh, I know you know, but I don't. I'm, I'm kind of talking to like you because you know you probably know a little bit about the situation, but like the people who are listening may have never heard of me. Um, but uh, I'm working on a third book. It's taken me a really long time to get it out. Most of the reason has been children. But there have been other side things like I've decided to change the way I'm telling. Like I always knew what the story was going to be in the final book. But uh, the way I was going to go about telling the story has changed like three times. And it's kind of made a lot of rewrites. Um, <laughs> so that and the while I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close to a version that I really like now, I'm really at the end of it where I just want to I want to make a, a more epic feel to the ending of the book. Um, right mm-hmm. now it's it's there. Like if someone picked it up and read it, it would make sense, but uh, it wouldn't feel complete. Um, so that's about where I am in the, uh, in the writing process of the third book right now. No, it's, it's definitely a good thing that you take your time with the story, because one thing that I actually noticed after listening, cause I, I didn't read your books. I listened to them on audible, uh, cause you know, I'd like to multitask and listening to something just kind of helps me function better, but it's, it's actually well narrated by the way. And one thing I noticed was how I, I couldn't find many inconsistencies in your story. You know, you seem to have covered everything or at the very least thought of what you need to cover in order to have this make sense to whoever's listening or reading the book, which I actually appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah, no, there's only one. I actually had a question on your first Uh book. (laughs) No, it's okay. It's it's nothing major. It's pretty simple. Um, Uh, I'll I'll just say I I know what the flaws in the book are. I always Mm -hmm. am surprised if someone says one that I haven't heard or, or know or thought of. Uh, but go ahead. Let's, uh, let's hear. <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. It's early in your first book when Jonathan and his entourage are chilling at the bar and Hayer is there just sort of looking at him, you know, keeping an eye on him. And Grant was there now since spoiler alert, I guess for whoever hasn't read it, <laughs> um, Hayer is in the body of Grant's father. Right. So, so I, I know where you're going. Okay. I, I am, I'm going to admit to you that I did not think of that until I started to write the second book. Uh, and I, and it occurred to me, and that's one of the reasons I made a big point of, um, changing Hare's hair color. Mm-hmm. So, uh, when there's a point when Grant finally confronts him, he says, your, your hair is different. Um, because you know, when he saw the pictures of his, uh, of his father, they were, he was a dirty brown haired, um, kind of look. Mm-hmm. And then when he saw his father in the bar, he had this like, very kind of like uh, I forget the toe-headed. Um, it's it's kind of like the the blonde that won't, usually only children have mm-hmm. uh, when they're really young, and that was kind of an attempt to make it so like maybe he wouldn't have noticed the guy there uh, because he you know and even if he had it, it wouldn't have occurred to him. Also, there's a little bit going on with uh, Hare's device, um, giving him a, a more youthful appearance than he should mm-hmm. have, so he might not have recognized him. But yes, I did not. I did not think of it when I wrote the original first book, if I'm being 100% honest, but I did try to cover for it in the books that came after because I was like, oh, yeah, that messed that one up there. No, you, did, <laughs> you did a good job in general because it, it's funny because me and my friends were actually debating about that because I mm-hmm. I put on about five friends to your book and books and they loved it. And mind you, these are a group of individuals who I love with all my heart, but they don't really take my advice when it comes to reading mm-hmm. and they all loved your book. So we had a very long conversation about that particular bar scene and we were all like trying to justify like, wait a second. Well, maybe he just didn't see him at the bar because he had a fedora on. Maybe he just had like a different look and, you know, he was being sort of incognito and whatnot. But yeah, so no, that that definitely I guess that makes sense with the hair color and everything, which um, is really great, by the way. Mm -hmm. So one of my friends had a question that he wanted me to ask you because I was pretty excited and I told him that I was going to, I was going to be interviewing you and uh, they wanted to get a sense on when your third book is going to be released, like more or less. Yeah. I get that question a lot and (laughs) yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just be really honest. This is the, this is the problem. So even if I was done, like if, if tomorrow I was like the end, I'm going to send this to the editor. I wouldn't give anyone a date because I'm going to send it to the editor and they're going to tell me, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll have it to, back to you in two weeks. But that doesn't, that's not a guarantee, you know, like uh, a lot of times they, they end up spending a lot more time than they thought they were going to. Um, and I just, I really hate being wrong uh, when I, when I put a date onto the internet. Um, 
I've been bitten by it before. Like uh, the first when I was first publishing the sequel, I did two major mistakes, and, and that was one, I released a title for the book that was actually premature. It was what I thought the title was probably going to be, um, and then it actually ended up. I actually ended up changing it at the end because the the title I had picked for the second book when I was writing it didn't didn't end up. So there's this thing that happens a lot with 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 writing where you don't really understand what your book's about until it's finished, mm-hmm. and then you and then you kind of Stephen King um, you know talks about this and I and he said it better than I ever could, which I can't quote him, but I'm basically going to rip him off right now, um, which is uh, you you write the first draft and then you look at it and it's and it's not like you as a writer like thought of all the foreshadowing and, and every little like thing you're like oh i'm gonna make i'm gonna make the color red be a be a thing in this book you, what you do is you you reread your first draft and you start to see it that you already did it and then you go back and you amplify the parts of that you like um or that you want to tell so like a lot of times that's what i'm saying you get to the end of the book and you realize that's you know because the original title for the second book was going to be the never trespass mm-hmm. um and it was all going to be kind of more um geared towards the 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 act of the prophet um of Malkir or the mm-hmm. prophet um kind of going against his own his own uh admonitions with the uh with the ferox as well as doing something that you know ended up affecting Jonathan's life a great deal but by the time I finished writing it I, d- I didn't really I didn't feel like it was a catchy title the word trespass I was kind of forcing in there because it kind of sounded biblical you know, like uh, those who trespass against you, and 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 uh, I really just I liked the idea of focusing on the fact that the ending, you know, features kind of like a paradox conversation um, more. So I changed the title, but then a bunch of people were really confused, you know, because I had told them at the end of the first book that it was going to be called the Never Trespass. Anyway, I'm getting off on a really long tangent here, but no, basically okay. what I'm saying is I'm really like. I really don't like um, putting any information that might end up not being true out on the internet, like about mm-hmm. a date. Right now, I feel like I'm really close to finishing the final draft. What will happen after that is I will send it to two alpha readers. And these are just people that have been like ver- voracious fans um, and that I trust because I've sent the material before and it's never leaked on the Internet yet or yeah. anything like that. Um, and uh, and they'll get back to me. and They'll be like, oh, yeah, I hated it or I loved it. And if they like it, I'll send it off to the editor. After that, it goes to I have a, a team of about 50 beta readers. Mm-hmm. So I usually give them a month or I try to tell them two weeks, but it usually kind of ends, extends to a month um, where I want to get all their feedback. And they're like the last line of defense, right? Like, so if, if I have Jonathan walking out of a store, you know, in the middle of the day and all of a sudden it's, it's midnight and he's still having the same conversation with the person he was walking next to, <laughs> then they're, they're the ones that have to catch that last thing. Cause mm-hmm. editors can do tons of things, but they aren't perfect. Yeah. Um, anyway. So like, they usually are really good and they, then they catch all those last little details um, before the book actually comes out. But I do usually put the book up for pre-order about the time I send it to the, to the beta readers. So usually I'll be able to give, in other words, I'll be able to give people about a month notice, maybe Mm -hmm. maybe a month and a half when, when it's going to come out, but I don't know what that date is. So that was a really long answer. No, it's okay. Please. Mm -hmm. I I, want to hear this actually. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and um. A lot of people, by the way, don't don't ever feel bad about the audiobooks. I actually believe by far that they're the superior product, and um, because like I um I, so I went through twenty two auditions before I found Stephen Barnett. And he actually kind of snuck in at the end. Oh wow! Um, and I and I was almost about to give the deal to someone else, and then I heard his voice, and I was like, oh god. And I, he doesn't like this description, but I was like, you have this perfect like depressed nerd voice that <laughs> that is so perfect for most of this Jonathan. You know, and and he has the talent to do all the other stuff too. But like the the that's how he just sounds like how I want the the paragraph chunks, not the dialogue necessarily, but the paragraph mm-hmm. chunks to sound with his ordinary voice. Um, anyway, uh, what was I talking? But I worked really closely with him. So like every time he screams or something into the in the microphone, some people like gave him bad reviews for that. And I was like, no, mm-hmm. I, I told him to do that. You know, like I told him to yell that line, not not just like amplify it or make it sound like he was raising his voice. Cause I was like, no, he's, he's really angry um, right now. So, and it was, it was really great. Cause it's like, um, you kind of get to direct your own book mm-hmm. um, in, a, in, a, in a small degree. Um, but that's why I kind of, I always actually do recommend the audiobook because there's just like, there's only so much you can capture with, uh, with an exclamation point And he said, or he said angrily, you know, like uh, there's, there's that degree of um, 
acting that gets lost um, for what and and if you spend too time describing it, you distract from the story anyway. So, but, but him just being able to say it how it's supposed to be said, I feel like actually gets the reader a better idea of what the story is supposed to feel like in any given moment. So. No, definitely. I actually thought he did a really good job, and I mm -hmm. personally like listening to audiobooks because once more, it's just a time saving factor. Mm -hmm. And he did. He sounded the way I would envision these characters sounding, in particular Jonathan's roommates. Um, outside of Paige, because obviously it's hard for him to emulate like a woman's voice perfectly. But um, hearing those, those two characters in particular, I actually wanted to mention this to you. His roommates are great because those are the same type of conversations that I have with my friends and my roommates. Mm -hmm. I, I would literally be able to listen and read an entire book about them just like mm -hmm. having a day where they're talking about the philosophy of certain movies and the way time travel works and like the Christ imagery and the whole Superman thing that they had going on. I thought that that was really good. And one thing, speaking of time travel that I wanted to mention, um, I actually like the way you did it because in a lot of stories, like when they were talking about Terminator, for example, they were talking about how you're able to send living tissue, but you can't send like a weapon, but yet the Terminator is able to go through because he's a mm -hmm. robot, but he's covered in living tissue. So why can't you just like put a skin sack and like throw some weapons in there? I mm -hmm. thought that that was cool because you did like this sort of like alternate reality slash Groundhog Day thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that that fit because most time travel stories never really make sense to me. You yeah. Know? So, oh, yeah, um, I was kind of going out of my way. Actually, I think my editor wanted me to take that out originally, but I kind of wanted to make the setup for the book to be like, I promise I'm not going to. Um, it was almost like a, like the author being like, I'm pointing this out because I promise I'm not going to get to the end of this book and just like pull some fast bullshit rule. And I'm sorry about the swearing. If you don't no, you can it. swear. It's okay. Um, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It, it's not really meta, but it is kind of a way of saying like, I'm not going to do this to you guys. If if I if I can make this make sense, it's going to make sense. You know. Um, sorry, but I kind of interrupted you. No, no, it's okay. I'm just saying that I've always appreciated that because. That's one thing that I really enjoy about your story and your writing is the fact that you're so consistent with this stuff. You know, you have the whole like art imitating life. There's a lot of foreshadowing that does come to play later on. And I, I really I honestly couldn't find many flaws at all as far as like your technique. And I don't know how much of that has to do with like editing or, or the beta readers that you have reading the material for you prior, like catching your mistakes and whatnot. Um, but it, it's fantastic, man. And I also wanted to ask you, how much of this story relates to your life? Um, is there any of you in there? Yeah, I mean, Jonathan is like if I was if I was my if I was my ideal version of myself. Who because like every time he responds to a woman or something like that, he does it so. Um, no, I wouldn't say he does it perfectly, but like there's moments in those books where uh, the one thing I really like about Jonathan is that he thinks before he talks most of the time, mm -hmm. um, and everything I regret in my life has probably been a moment where I was angry and I spoke out of turn, but he doesn't really do that. You know, uh, he, like he gets control of himself even when he's angry and kind of sees when someone has a good point or, you know what I mean? Like, uh, he doesn't do it so much with hair. Um, but like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose myself in this. Uh, but, okay. but I, I like, like there's a lot of times where, where Jonathan kind of admits, admits that people have a point And I feel like in my own life, I struggle with that. You know, I think everyone does, you know, like if you're in an argument, you struggle to admit that the other person has a point, but I really hate that about myself. Like mm -hmm. I hate when the pride gets in the way that I can't see a good point when it's made. And what happens to me all the time is the next day I realize they had a really good point and I have to go back to them and be like, okay, you were right. I was just, you know, my pride was getting in the way so I couldn't hear you. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's anything about Jonathan, I like is that he, he doesn't do that. He sees that they have a good point in the moment. Um, and I don't know if that's something you picked up about the character, but it's something that it's, it's, it's the one part of him I feel like the most, it would be the most fictitious almost mm -hmm. because it's, it's so hard to be that way. It's that's, that's my ideal. My ideal hero would, would be the guy that can basically do that, which is mm -hmm. like see reason um, didn't and get, and get his um, himself out of it. Uh, yeah. Well, he's very self-aware. That's true. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's an issue with most people in life, you know, like when you're writing a book versus you having an interaction with a person at that particular moment, it's a lot different because when you're writing, you have time to think out precisely what you want to say and you have time to think out the responses or potential points that those people are trying to make versus you having a regular interaction. Because in the real world, 
no one's perfect. You know, we're, we're not always going to stop and think. Sometimes yeah. we're just going to speak out of term. And then, like you said, with the benefit of hindsight and you actually taking time to reflect on what you said, you realize, all right, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. My bad. <laughs> well, so, yeah, I, re- I, re- I really do think that's like it's, it's, it's funny to think that way, but it's like the greatest sign of a human like of a good human being. I don't know what word I wanted to say that, but like every time in my life that I've admitted to someone that I was wrong. One, I felt better, and and I gained their respect. Didn't lose it, um, mm-hmm. and that's that's a funny thing that people kind of that's like a, like a paradox that goes on when you're in these in like a heated conversation. Is like you don't want to admit you're wrong, but but at the same time, it's not going to have the effect that you're imagining. Usually, admitting you're wrong, especially when you're really wrong, is uh is only going to make the person be like, oh, this is a reasonable human being who just needed to be given a point mm-hmm. that shows the error, and then he changed his mind. You know, like. And and uh, I mean I'm gonna trail off there, but you think you get what I'm what I'm what I'm saying? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, they're no. gonna respect you for it, not disrespect you for it. I I totally understand that because like me personally, I've had that issue throughout my years of existence, and sure. I find that when you do take that time to reflect and just really think about what you said, those people will have more respect for you. I completely agree with you on that. And not only that, but people also have to be able to see their own flaws as well. And they have to acknowledge like, hey, maybe you had a point. Like there should be some sort of common ground there or at the very least an understanding. And I I think that's really good. And I like that about your characters because they can all kind of see their flaws. You know, like they're all very introspective, you know, and I haven't really I would say. Because uh, Hayden and Colin, they're they're just like two friends of mine. So whenever I'm listening to them talk, I can see and hear my friends in them. Mm-hmm. And I I felt that you have a very realistic style of writing when it comes to just people having conversations. And I thought it was great. Like, I like how they debate about all this, like, nerd culture. You know, they're talking about movies. And, you know, um, one, one thing that I actually liked that you did, there was a part in, I think it's the second book, where Jonathan asked the question, like, you know, why does it rain in these movies? And I loved your response to that because it's like, okay, rain is a sign of change, you know, like something's always happening. But then you actually give examples as to not just confuse a reader and they can actually see that in their minds because if they've seen any of these movies in the past and they'd, they'd understand. And you, you, you have a very like a uh, philosophical way to get your points across with each individual character. Cause they're all, they're all different from each other, but the same in a sense. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, they're, they're all, they're all parts of me. Uh, and the, what you're mentioning earlier, uh, kind of reminded me of a thing, a lot of, um, writers, and I don't know where they, where this like became a thing, you know, a lot of times when they want to, uh, to get across a universal kind of like element of a story. So like the rain thing you were talking about there a minute ago, like normally this is what I was trying to do differently in, in the whole series is I use modern references um so like the matrix and you know the shawshank redemption and stuff like that because i i I don't want the person to have to be familiar with shakespeare so i don't want to quote shakespeare and have him be like oh yes because i feel like i feel like i get why writers want to do that um uh because you you know you you have this kind of uh the book will feel like it can live longer if you don't put modern references into a book you know like 30 Mm -hmm. years from now kids aren't necessarily going to know who Neo and the Matrix was. Uh, you know, even my kid doesn't, every time he says like, what? I don't remember that. I'm like, ah, but, you know, <laughs> anyway, uh, cause it was such a big part of my childhood. It's kind of like, it's kind of like Star Wars or something like that for, uh, anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent, but, but I wanted to use modern references instead of trying to like find some obscure, like story about, you know, uh, a labyrinth with a minotaur and, and so on and so forth. Like Joseph Campbell kind of, Used uh, used that as a great example at the beginning of his uh, the the hero with a thousand faces when he was mm-hmm. describing the hero's journey. It's like that, those are great, but if you can use something that they can relate to, I feel like it's a it's an easier way to give them access to the to the philosophical concept if you can make the connection. Yeah, you, you. I think you're. I'm probably just like paraphrasing what you were saying anyway. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. <laughs> like, no, but that that's that's very true because it made it easily digestible. You know, it's yeah. it's one of those stories that people can just pick up and read because. I think the longevity won't really be affected by using modern references in the sense that by today's standards, the way people think, they're not really thinking about Shakespeare. You know, they're thinking about what's uh, modern in like today's media. 
Mm-hmm. So to use the Matrix or to talk about Terminator, Shawshank Redemption, you know, these are things that people at the very least in our age range know. So, you know, later on, that to me, that's easier to explain than talking about Joseph Campbell's Hero of a Thousand Faces or going down the chart of the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. You know, people will use modern references in their stories like Star Wars and whatnot, like every hero story, basically. Um, which is which where your the formula that your story sort of follows as well. But I kind of like how you, you throw a lot of tropes out the window and you just kind of do your own thing. And I, I really enjoy that. Like, I think that's yeah. well, uh, I, I like to describe what, I, what what I try to do with the books. Actually, I mean, my goal, I don't know if I always succeed with it, is the idea is like, I am going to tell you exactly what's going to happen and have you still be surprised what it does. <laughs> that, that's the goal. Like, uh, uh, I mean, I want to just foreshadow the hell out of everything, um, but still have the reader not expect it. That, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do in, in most of the books. Um, I'm not going to like force it if uh, if the story wouldn't work for it. Um, but I, I do tend to to tr- that's that's my secret desire like mm-hmm. to achieve. That's my secret thing that I want to achieve when I'm when I'm writing these books. Um, I don't really have anything to follow that up. With. <laughs> I don't know why I got off on that tangent, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, um, no, no worries. I actually wanted to I wanted to ask about some of your characters. So Riley's character, is she like a particular inspiration from like somebody that you know in your personal life? No, I took I um I did Capoeira for uh, three or four years. I cannot do it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's just it's it was too hard on my back and shoulders. And I'm it's one of the reasons like I think I mentioned to you I don't really work out anymore is like my joints and stuff are just they're just messed up from how I treated them. Mm-hmm. when my in my 20s and early 30s um so like i, I do some cardio and i'm good because yeah. anything else all i'm doing is like i'm gonna feel like an arthritic grandpa um uh, but uh she is basically i just liked i liked the culture and the women i met that did capoeira mm-hmm. um so i had i don't have a like a lot of um there's not a lot of different cultures that I could, that I could effectively write and feel like I was getting it right. Like for instance, in this, in the, in the third book, it's called the never army. I've always wanted to bring a ton of, um, of more uh, diversity in when, when every, when every soldier on the planet comes, comes there. Cause we're not just, they're not just in the United States. They're yeah. they're you know, <clears throat> so like, uh, and I don't, I don't know if this is spoiling too much cause I have a feeling that everyone kind of knows that Jonathan's, eventually going to lead an army. Um, but cause I mean that I'm not spoiling anything. Yeah, that's, no. been, that's been, that's been <laughs> said. That's share, kind of what, you share whatever you, you feel comfortable sharing. I, I just don't want to, you know, like I don't want to ruin anything for anyone, but, uh, that, that means he's, he's, he's dealing with, with people from all over the world. Um, and he has to lead them. Uh, so with, with the Brazilian culture, um, I felt comfortable doing a full character arc Mm-hmm. Because I didn't feel like I was going to get it wrong, um, and apparently I haven't. Because uh, I've had a few people, um, Brazilian readers or people from Brazil, mm-hmm. um, that have read the book and be like, "Oh, it's just so cool to see myself represented in this in this character." Mm-hmm. Um, and and I did. I wanted to. I, I definitely wanted to make um, a cinematic kind of fighter. Like, and and that's the thing about Capoeira. Like, it, it's great to look at, but it's not really. It's not it's not a highly effective fighting style unless you are really good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, I liked the idea that if you had superpowers, it might be, you know, uh, because the way it, the way you could move if you were if you were so you know um, hard to kill and, and resilient uh, and like it wouldn't break your leg to kick someone a certain way or something like that mm-hmm. could be highly effective in that situation. Again, I'm stretching I'm stretching physics and stuff like that for the fun of it, but I wanted that that experience of a, of a character in her fighting style. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Or? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, if you have a device embedded in your chest that allows you to, to have like super speed and strength and whatnot, those things would make more sense, especially because mm-hmm. Capoeira is very fancy. Like yeah. it, it's very like pretty to look at, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I mean, uh, the gym that I go to, well, at, at least it's closed for now, but when it opens up again, they have a uh, Capoeira classes that they do there as well. So I always see like the instructors doing like the, the dance motions and whatnot. And just teaching like some other students, but I, I I could see how it would be effective if you just had the ability to like crush a skull with your kick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think that's pretty cool. 
I also, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about one of my favorite characters in the book um, was Lincoln. And I enjoy his character because I'm very much into fitness and I like his like no nonsense, unapologetic attitude that he has towards like everything. And the way he was introduced in the book, you could tell that like him and Jonathan were going to become friends because when, after Jonathan's first fight with the Ferox, he was sort of like depressed. He was lost. He was trying to find his way. And Lincoln was like the first person to make him laugh when he uh, approached those two girls at the gym. Yeah. So I, I guess what I want to know about Lincoln is, is he going to make an appearance? Because I believe in the second book, he kind of like disappeared. And I have a theory before uh, you answer. <laughs> and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I feel like Lincoln is a part of the cell. No. No? You're not the first person to have that theory. And it would be a great red herring for me to have to, to play up because so many people seem to think that. Um, and it's funny, people, audiobook listeners get that impression. And I think it's because someone, someone in the audiobook reviews once said that the voice the narrator was using for Lincoln was somebody else's voice that was uh, in the cell. I forget the exact mm -hmm. reference. And it might be a subconscious connection because of that. Um, but also, he's also the guy that's off screen the most. You don't get to see a lot of him. So that that's generally a big, you know, like you ever watch any of the Scream movies, you, you mm -hmm. know who the killer is going to be before you get to the end because it's just the guy that you see the least of uh, in most cases. Anyway, uh, but uh, Lincoln is actually based on a real person. He's actually there actually is a Lincoln Smith. And I when I worked at a gym for a year and that whole scene with the with the uh, with the, the two girls. Um, it's funny. It's the one scene I wish I could change because a lot of people feel it's very sexist. Um, mm -hmm. But the truth is, it, it's a thing that actually kind of played out at the gym one day and it was hilarious. And it was because and you have to kind of realize um, that we know when a person doesn't really want to want a gym membership, they just want to use the free pass for a day. Yeah. It's just kind of what those girls were up to in, in the gym. So like the idea that, you know, that he might necessarily offend them or something like that. You know, he was just kind of joking around, but he was also Lincoln is also a theater major. He, he actually does want to be a pro did want to be a pro wrestler. He's had a kid now and he's uh, actually, I think he's becoming a firefighter at the moment, mm -hmm. but uh, it's funny because I still contact Lincoln um, in scenes in the third book. I'll be like, so just so I don't have to be too creative, how do you think you'd reply if this happened? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and he gets back to me. He was like, well, this is how I think I'd reply. Um, and it's kind of neat because there's there's like a real person to try to put in there. Um, now, the reason he disappears at the end of the second book is actually a lot more depressing than you might be imagining. Oh. Uh, okay. He he actually does get fired um, for a legit reason. Um, and that's why he sends that last message to Jonathan. And that gets covered pretty early um, in the third book. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah it's good call. Part. Um, I kind of figured because it, it just felt too coincidental that he suddenly gets fired when everything is starting to like come together. And yeah. that, that sort of made me believe, damn, like was Lincoln in the cell this whole time? Um, uh, apparently that's not the case. No, it's, 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 it's awesome that you caught that though. Cause that, that would be excellent writing. <laughs> yeah. if, if it was, if it was yeah, right. You know, they've been watching him from the beginning. So you would yeah. figure that, you know, ever since he uh, got out of the hospital, they have, they've sort of been watching him. So they planted somebody in there early on. Like, hey, Grant took him to this gym and Grant was sort of involved, even though they didn't give him too much information on what was going on. Um, I, I personally didn't feel that the the scene with the the two girls, I didn't think it came across as sexist. I think that it was built in a way where they were, you know, like, for instance, they told Jonathan that he looked like he was homeless mm -hmm. and they generally had a bad attitude. You know, they just looked like they didn't really give a crap about anything. And they were like very into themselves. So Lincoln was trying to kind of like, he wasn't even, he wasn't hitting on them. He was trying to make them uncomfortable so they could leave. Yeah. So, so to me, I don't, I don't really think it came across as sexist. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was going for. I just, I, I read my reviews sometimes on, and, and I know that some women find it offensive. So that's out yeah. there. Um, I do regret it. I, would, I wish I could rewrite it or change it a few things about it, but not necessarily the whole scene. Mm. Um, maybe take the part out where, never mind. You know what? I won't, I won't explain it. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, say, you know, it's funny that you, you mentioned um, Lincoln being a red herring is uh, I turned page into a red herring um, in the first book after the first wave of beta readers, because a lot of people and I realized I, I had kind of um, done it on accident. A lot of people thought that the cell was getting was had somehow influenced her to be in Jonathan's life. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I realized why they, why they thought that. So that, that was kind of why I, I originally changed the first book so that um, they were telling Grant that they were watching her, you mm-hmm. know, because they were trying to keep him away from realizing who the, who the real target was. Um, even though Grant kind of had his own reasons for being there in the first place. And he, and he had a little bit more, you know, he kind of, I, I mean, anyone who hasn't read the book isn't, isn't going to want to hear me go off into too much detail about this, but um, you know what I'm talking about. So mm-hmm. like that, that actually was a change that came from a beta reader where I actually amplified the idea that that was true um, just to give them a false, you know, uh, road to go down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's actually pretty interesting. I didn't know that. It, <laughs> it's such an interesting story because I've, uh, I've actually been listening to the books again um, because like I've been doing, you know, because of quarantine and whatnot, I've been working out at home more often, or I've been going for bike rides with my mask on, you know, like around the park safely. And um, I, I always found that the books were inspirational when it came to my fitness. Like I was listening to them while I'd be at the gym and I I'd, I'd push out a pretty good workout. Um, so how like is this you you know you said that you studied martial arts at one point and you did like capoeira was the gym like a big factor in your life like as far as knowledge base when when it came to writing the book because it sounds like you you really knew what you were talking about yeah um so I, i've done boxing i've done some kung fu i have done some staff training i am self-taught with nunchucks um not i can i can make nunchucks look good i cannot mm-hmm. fight with them that's, that's a whole true. different thing but, but wanting to like that, um, yeah. I've only broken a few stereos. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and let's see what else. So capoeira, kung fu. I did taekwondo as a child, but I don't really count that as anything other than, you know, it, it's surprising. Like you, taekwondo gets a lot of bad raps, and I wouldn't use it to actually defend myself. But as far as teaching a child really basic things, like how to throw a basic punch or mm-hmm. how to stand, I mean, those, those things are still good, uh, you know, uh, even though it's not necessarily the most effective fighting style, it's, it still teaches you some basics that, that, that are, that let, I think Jonathan even says that in the books, like if he'd only taken a kickboxing class at some point in his life before he had to start this, he'd, he'd already have been so much further along mm-hmm. uh, just because there's so much basic stuff that you, you don't really think about um, if you've never, if you've never taken a martial arts. Um, but as far as the, uh, the exercise thing, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I started really exercising when I was 19. I was overweight. So I was like, I was like 200 pounds and I was 19 and I was, I just, you know, kind of wanted to be doing better with the ladies. So like, uh, I got, I started that. working out a lot. Um, it started, it started mostly as running and then I started lifting weights. Um, and by the time I graduated college, uh, I had been working out for about five days a week for almost 10 years. Uh, that's an exaggeration, maybe like a uh, six or seven years. But then I, then I went to work for a gym and then I met a bunch of personal trainers. So I learned uh, what I was doing wrong and all the things that I was self-taught on, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and I was also selling gym memberships and I was surrounded by supplements all the time. So I started learning a lot about that. Um, and then, uh, it wasn't until, yeah, about, about the age of 32, my body just kind of started turning on me. So until then, I was really into work, exercising. So a lot of the times when I'm when people say the book's motivational, well, yeah, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of cramming 12 years of things I used to keep myself going to the gym into these, into these like 350-page books. So it's very concentrated. Like every time I had a deep thought that kept me going, you know, like it's put in these books. Um, so... Yeah, I, I get that, but right now, no. I, I, I mean, I haven't taken a real active interest in fitness probably since the books, you know, first got published. I don't know if that's a, 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 a letdown. I don't. Well, want no, to. not at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. expecting you to be exactly like your books. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get it. I mean, look, this is the real world. You know, you said you have bad joints. You also have children. You know, your your time is occupied. So I completely understand that. Yeah, um, I've, I've had my ups and downs with, with fitness as well. Like I remember I was training a while back because I wanted to get into MMA mm-hmm. and um, I was actually scheduled to do like an exhibition. But then I ended up hurting my knee and I, I was just like walking down the stairs and one day it just like fell apart on me. It just buckled and I couldn't. Oh. Yeah. And I thought that, all right, maybe I can walk this off. But that wasn't the case. And I ended up having to go to physical therapy for it. 
And once I, I recovered the knee, I just didn't want to do the fighting anymore. You know, like I kind of got scared. I didn't want to take that risk. Um, so like, you know, that, that kind of made me think of uh, Jonathan's character because one thing that he stressed was he didn't want to get injured, you know, yeah. because if he get activated, he wouldn't want to be activated with an injury that, that can cost him his life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of just wish that I took better care and precaution in my own training. Uh, yeah. So right now I'm just, you know, doing podcasts and uh, <laughs> streaming <laughs> on Twitch because I'm a nerd as well. You know, um, I love wrestling, which which is why I liked about Lincoln also, because he was like a wrestling fan. And um, <sighs> but, yeah, I mean, if you like Lincoln, it, it's funny, like every everything that character says for the most part, I mean, I change it. But like when he tells Jonathan to watch uh, uh, Vision Quest. Mm hmm. That was Lincoln picked that movie. He was like, and I had to actually go watch it because I had never seen it. I was like, well, great. Now I got to go watch this movie so I can put it in the book if it works. Yeah. Um, but like all, all of it's pretty real. Um, so like he's a real dude. Um, wow, that's pretty dope. He's the only one. Uh, there's no other characters in there that are based on actual people. Uh, other, I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, Jonathan's, like I said, Jonathan is who I would wish I could be if if I was in the situation, but it, it's not really me. Um, and actually, the funny thing is, um, if you had asked uh, the the original character that was in the book that was me was Colin, mm-hmm. and I ended up editing a lot of it out uh, because I liked it, but I knew it was just going to sound like a guy using his own book as a soapbox to preach things. <laughs> so. I just, I, I kind of, I parted him way down um, and took anything that wasn't relevant to the story immediately out. And then you kind of still get a gist of it. Um, but in the end, I'd say Hayden is the part of me that like is always thinking about stories. And then like Colin is the part of me that gets mad at creationism being called science. Um, and, uh, you know, with that, I'm trailing off because I no know. no it's okay that, that that's fine actually I wanted to ask about Colin it's it's funny that you brought him up um, so him and Paige does that is that ever going to become a thing I feel like I'd disappoint a lot of people if it didn't um, it's funny there's a I'm going to mention this I'm going to mention it I'm going to try to mention this there's a part in the third book right now that I'm working on that I have currently on the chopping block is maybe going to get edited out. Um, and it's, it's kind of a situation, uh, you know what? I can't, I can't go into this cause it, it's spoilery. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's uh, okay. I'll tell you after the show. How about that? Right. Yeah. yeah no, when I hit the end broadcast, uh, you, you can let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I, I found his character interesting because that was sort of me when I was younger, mm-hmm. you know, like I would like a girl and I didn't have the courage to tell her, or I would see like the type of dudes that she was interested in. And I didn't measure up to that. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it kind of I resonated with his character when it came to that. Nowadays, it's not that's not so much as, you know, the issue because I'm an old, I mean, I'm 36, so I'm not, I'm not a child anymore. And I have common sense and I know how to communicate with people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I like I like that. And, you know, because because of the type of men that Paige likes, you know, she likes these like yeah. big, strong guys and whatnot. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of made me wonder, like, oh, is he going to start hitting the weights a little more since he saw how Jonathan you know, started working out and he changed his entire body. Um, yeah. And so I, I was wondering about that. I wanted to ask you something about Leah because mm-hmm. I haven't really bought Leah into this very much. Leah you... is funny. Oh, sorry. No, no, no go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask after you tell me what you're going to tell me about her. Leah, Leah is a tricky character um, and, and a lot of people dislike her, but they don't really realize that they haven't, really seen anything from her point of view yet like it's very minimal um so like the entire first book as you know she's turns out to be something that she's not so the way i wrote all of her scenes is that you never see inside her head you only see what she's feeling so mm-hmm. she'll like a lot of times when she says stuff, says stuff that's really vague too like she goes like why are they always damaged when when jonathan's walking away from her because he seems depressed but that's not what she's really talking about. She's not like talking about guys that she she's attracted to. Why do I always pick the damaged one? She means she knows what's going. She knows on some degree what's happening to him. Mm-hmm. And so he says, why are when she says, why are they always damaged? She means like, why is it that every one that comes in contact with this alien, you know, has, get, ends up with PTSD and, and, uh, and starts falling apart. And, and that's what she really meant. Um, a lot of people think that. she meant, 
just you know typical oh i always like the damaged ones you know like like yeah. she's a girl like that and i feel like um a lot of times people don't even finish the book before they you know again i, I go back to the sexism thing because like a lot of times these books don't reveal who the characters are until until you get to the end and so what a, what a character seems really superficial or basic you, you have to you have to see how that plays out before you, you really realize their motivations um, but you know, it's still a failure of mine as a writer if I can't keep them hooked long enough to get there. So, mm -hmm. you know, no, I, I actually like her character. I, well, first of all, I didn't even know that she was involved in the cell until it happened. Mm -hmm. So I thought she was, Hey, the neighbor that moved in and, you know, she kind of took a liking to him. Now I had mm -hmm. suspicions, but I wasn't fully sure. Mm -hmm. And I, I do like her character because she is very complex in a, in a lot of ways, because on one hand, she wants to figure out what's going on because her brother disappeared. But at the same time, she also genuinely likes Jonathan. Like yeah. that, that's not fate. So yeah. it, it's a question of where her loyalties lie, you know. But it, it's like at the same time, she wants to get across to her her dad that hey, I can do this job. I want to figure out what happened to my brother. Let's stop this alien. And at mm -hmm. the same time, she's conflicted because of her feelings for him. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that actually makes her character very interesting in in that uh, sense. And yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because I I definitely worry that um that people see her as more of a villain. Um, but the truth is I feel, I feel like um, she, she's redeemable with context. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of that's in the third book. Um, my narrator actually told me after I've actually met him. Like, so we're actually, you know, that's, that's underplaying. We've become pretty good friends because he, he lived in Florida when he recorded the first book, mm -hmm. but he's moved um, to Oregon, actually Salem. Well, you know, I probably shouldn't be giving away too many details, but of his exact location yeah. <laughs> but uh but he basically lives where my wife's family lives um so almost every time we go down to visit i spend a couple hours just at his house hanging out and then one day i'm sitting there and he's like man you're not leah's leah's not coming back from this um you know like and i was like yeah she is like i, I can i can do this it's like it's like a challenge um and i think i have uh and again i, I i'm such uh, horrible secret keeper like uh, <laughs> but like I, I feel like her redemption arc in the third book um would do it for me as a reader uh so yeah there's that um yeah, I, i'm actually looking forward to, to hearing how her story ends because again she's a realistic character in my mind because if my brother disappeared suddenly and then i see that all the people that are being involved with this alien are also disappearing and they're following the same patterns. Hey, you got to think as a real person, how would you really feel? Because this hits close to home. It's not like she's just doing a job because mm -hmm. if she were just planted there to watch him without any context, without knowing that something like this happened to her own family member, then you could see her as just sort of being very unlikable. Mm -hmm. But Given the fact that she has been personally affected by this, it, it gives her that sense that she wants to really figure out what is going on. Yeah. And now that they've captured Hayer, and you know the the rest of the crew, well, except for Paige and and Jonathan's mom. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I really want to see what's going to happen with them. Also, the okay. uh, which with, with which two? Oh, uh, with, with, Paige, with Paige and Jonathan's mom. Oh yeah, uh, Evelyn, Evelyn. Yeah, like I want to figure out what's going to like. How are they going to you know sort of go into rescue mode? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know the two are captured, and then you added that that dude. I forgot his name at the very last minute that, that started so, talking. Uh, Anthony him. Holt. Yeah which is my, I'll just give it away. He's going to be a complete Tony Stark ripoff, uh, <laughs> but he's going to be aware of it too. Like uh, not, not, not entirely. Like, like he will not be Iron Man, but, but that's kind of the, that's why I called him Anthony anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's just cause it's like, I've, I've literally thought of like, if I gave that guy a weapon, it's going to be an ax and it's going to be called the Stark, you know, uh, <laughs> or something like that. It, that has not been written into the book, so it's not like a spoiler, but it's thoughts that went through my mind when I was writing the second one. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I interrupted. What, what was your curiosity about? Oh, no, I, I was just asking because he, he came in out of nowhere. You know, he wasn't in the first or, or and he's at the very end of the second book. Mm -hmm. So he outside of Mr. Clean, Hayer did have a contact on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does he also have a device or is he just like a trusty companion? I still have room to make a decision on that. Um, there's some dynamics that I try. Okay. So one thing that I didn't like about the second book is that there is very detailed at points to the point that it bogs down the story. 
And I did that because I did want the third book to be able to be more streamlined. Mm -hmm. But there will be some points where there's going to be some like, you know, weird time mechanics and, and there's no avoiding an explanation um, if people are going to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a dynamic um, in the third book where if Anthony has a device or if he doesn't, will be important to whether or not the story works. Um, so right now, as he was, as you leave him in the second book, all you're supposed to really know is he's super rich. He's controlling a bunch of companies. Hayer has contacted him at least a decade over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Um, and he is developing things that Hayer wants for the coming problems. I have to. Um, but he's also the go-to contact in the situation where Hare gets himself in trouble. So I think that, I feel like that's no spoiler. That's pretty much what, what the... Yeah, no, that, that's kind of what I figured from there. But I, it, it makes sense with the continuity of how you write your books because you also introduced Riley at the end of the first book. And then she yeah. becomes a, a prominent character in the second book. So introducing another character at the, at the end of your second book, it makes sense, you know, with him leading into the third book. Yeah, that's um a thing I like to do. I call it... I don't call it that. I've heard of it. It's called story symmetry. Mm -hmm. So um, I want the beats of the first and second books, even though the second book is much longer, to be similar to the first one. You know, so like if I'm going to be jumping around, you know, 30 years in the past, 20 years in the future, blah, blah, blah. I'm only going to do that at the very beginning of the book. Um, and then that and then we're going to get a linear story. And then mm -hmm. at the end, we're going to introduce a third, you know, that, yeah, that's kind of the format of, of, of both the first books. Of course, the third one probably can introduce a character in the last chapter and be like, ah, you know, yeah. but because it's going to be the finale. But uh, but I wanted to keep up that that symmetry of the story. Um, if that if that answers that. No, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Are there going to be any spinoffs? I have. So it's funny you mentioned how you liked talking about Colin and Hayden. Uh, I always like the idea of keeping them as uh, Christopher Moore. If you've ever read his stuff, does this? He has characters that show up um, in his other books. You know, mm -hmm. like so, like a beloved character from uh, a book like I'm just blanking on on his book names, but like I think one of them is You Suck, and like uh, it's a vampire movie or book. Mm -hmm. uh, so like the characters from that will show up in his A Dirty Job book because it's the same universe, even though the stories are not related at all. Uh, yeah. So, but like, I like the idea of having Colin and Hayden be able to be like, you know, five years older and they're sitting in a coffee shop and like the characters in a other story are sitting there and they're overhearing these two geeks discuss something <laughs> and, and everyone that reads my stuff knows what's going on. I don't know if they would ever be like their own, their own character arcs, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if they'd ever um, be that involved in the story, but I like the idea of putting them into, uh, into future projects. Mm -hmm. like that. Um, now, the next thing I actually want to write is going to be fantasy. Um, I really want to do magic um, because one of the most stifling and difficult things about science fiction is that there's there's a degree of reality that it has to be grounded in mm -hmm. where you make up a, at least for me, there's a degree of reality. Like I actually stress out over, I'll, I'll tell you a problem I was having the other day as I was writing a scene, right? Um, so there's, there's this uh, two two activated people in the like cavian plants. Mm -hmm. One's much stronger than the other, and they're hitting a dummy, right? Uh, just to test their powers out. Um, the first one hits it, it. It kind of like cracks the dummy's chest, and it and the dummy flies across the room, and it's like, wow, I'm really powerful. And the next guy hits it, and his fist goes all the way through and out the back. And but like I sat there for maybe a half an hour, considering the physics of whether that would actually work. Because yeah, mm. you're talking like, okay, well, you have you have more pressure on a, in a fist size spot hitting a target, and then like, what sound would it make? You know, um, so if the dummy's very lifelike, if it's like, like a human, like a fake human, right? Say, imagine that. Um, if you hit if you hit it and its chest doesn't break, you get a big thwack, right? Yeah. Um, but if your fist goes through, you get a meaty kind of like thump, you know, like soupy <laughs> sound as it as it flies out the back. But would you know, these questions come to mind, like, but would there be that thunderclap at, when it when it first hits? Or would that kind of be drowned out by the, you know, kind of noise that... Anyway, uh, I was talking with four of my other writer friends as I was having this problem. They were all, just get over it, Todd. Just just let it happen. Just write it. <laughs> yeah, but but I, I my point was, is I was like, 
those details concern me. Um, like I don't want to get them wrong if I'm writing a science fiction book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know that the physics of super strength will never be perfect um, if you want them to be fun. But I want to be like as 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 a much attention to it as possible. And I feel like if I if I could write uh, a magic based world, then I can make a, a magic systems that 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 have rules and where people will will feel like they're real. But I don't have to be so trapped by understanding the science and mechanics of things. Like so I have a biology background and I'm pretty good at chemistry. Um, I did okay in physics. I I almost flunked the second physics class though, like physics 102, because I could not understand magnetism and electricity to save my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I mean, I, the, the basics that most people understand, they fine. But like, uh, when you're actually looking at like, um, you know, like, a you know, I don't even remember what they're called. Basically I really struggled with those mm-hmm. concepts when I was trying to do like math problems and stuff in those physics classes. And I barely passed. Um, now, if you put a electricity into a, a cell, like a human cell, and, and you're talking about like what's going to cause pores to open and release chemicals because of an electrical current, I can get that. But if you put it like it, it's funny because it should be simpler, right? Yeah. You put a battery in and a, a light bulb and a resistor in in, in, a, in a drawing, and I'm just like, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't get it at all. Like I, I mean. The basics, yes, but as soon as things get complicated, no. And I'm going to find a really – that was a really worthless tangent to go off on. No, no, it, it, uh, it actually makes sense. That makes sense because if, if you're going to write a magic story, you can sort of create like your own bull, you know? Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, funny. I'm not going to do the research because when you, when you do research – yeah, um, something like uh, science fiction based, you know, there, there's a certain degree of, of research that you have to do in order to make this make sense. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have people that are super nitpicky – be like, hey, man, uh, I just want to let you know that you were wrong about the way time travel works or you were wrong about GPS systems or whatever the case may be. So, I, I was wrong about GPS systems. Oh, were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the one that I was going to bring up. Uh, the only time where I, I could not find – I tried to – I did like two days of research and I could not find the specific information I needed to write – that whole GPS thing. So I just, I mean, I, I have a background in tech. I, I fixed computers for <clears throat> um, six years. So I just took my best swing and guessed at it. And the funny thing though, was only one person who has ever called me out. I got one email from one guy being like, yeah, that's, that's not how it works. But he was super cool about it because he explained how it did work. Mm-hmm. It's too late now. I can't, I can't change it, but yeah. it was super cool to finally get that specific information that I could not find. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> No, no, that's pretty awesome, man. I, I I look forward to it, man. And whenever you do release this third book, I just I just want you to know that everyone in my circle is going to buy it, uh, you know? and it's going to be awesome. And I I really want to thank you, man. Honestly, like this was a really good opportunity. I'm I'm glad you took the opportunity to speak to me. And in addition to that, your your books are great. Like they're just really good books. And I I tried to explain this to my friends before they they started listening to it because we're a very like mind. And, you know, we we had like long conversations about this and it, it's kind of sad that it's going to come to an end. You know, like there is an ending to this, but that's a part of the journey. And, you know, you're going to go into your next phase with this next uh, series in magic. And I'll be I'll be listening to that. I'll list. Well, I'll be listening to it. I'm not going to read it because <laughs> uh, I, I can't. You know what it is? It's my ADB. I can't sit for too long and just read a book like I, I have to do something. Don't don't you don't have to explain anything to me, man. Ever since I had kids, I can't hold a book. They won't let me. Yeah. You know, like I, I can only listen to audiobooks. And the only time I've picked up a physical book or a Kindle to read anything is if my wife <laughs> took them to go see grandma or something. Uh, yeah. You know, so it just doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> I live on audiobooks. Sorry about that. Mm. Yeah. So um I'm gonna step out in a few because I have to go pick someone up. But uh before you go. Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to like plug some of your work in, like where can people reach you? Um, I'll be putting this stuff in the description and I will also uh, be sending you a copy of this. So if you want to like use it for your own records as well, feel free. Uh, I want to help you get that exposure and you know, you're, you're doing me the favor as well. So where, where could people reach you, man? Um, you can get me at tlrhodges.com. Uh, there's a link there with all my contact information. Uh, on Facebook, it's just uh, facebook.com slash the never hero or search the never hero. Um, look me up on uh, TLR Hodges on Amazon if you're interested in the books or on Audible. I um, mm-hmm. should bring them all up. Uh, the Never Hero, The Never Paradox are the names of the first two books. 
Twitter, Taylor Hodges, you know, it's, it's all pretty, it's all uh, I'm easy to find. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I just I want to know where people can find you because you know I, I want to help spread the word, and I think what you're doing is, is great. And I don't know how um, how long it'll be until the next one. And did you, I have a few follow up questions? Did you have a good time? Yeah, I had a good time. Uh, I only worry that we talked really specifically about books that people haven't read necessarily mm-hmm. for your show, so it might be hard to make it anything other than like a super geeky you know if you if you're into this this will be fun mm-hmm. you get what i mean kind of no i get you I, I completely get it no it's all good man i i did want to talk about this stuff and i want to get your stuff out there and i want people to know about your works so mm-hmm. definitely I, I feel like we, we covered some of that definitely i mean is there anything in particular that you wanted to cover if you ever wanted to do like something in addition to this where we didn't necessarily go into that detail that would be fine with me though Oh, cool. Definitely. Hell yeah. That, that was going to be my next question. If, if you want to do a follow up at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Cool. Um, and yeah, man. And when, when this comes out, I'll promote it on the Never Hero site. So hopefully you'll get some traffic, mm-hmm. you know, people interested in your show and I'm happy to do that and appreciate being here. So. Yeah, man. No, definitely, man. So thank you for coming on board. And with that said, have a good day, man. Have a good day with your family. Enjoy your life, brother. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you, too. Have a good one.